The ocean covers 70% of the planet's surface, and most of the life on Earth is aquatic. Humanity hasn't explored the deep blue in full, but what we've seen so far is incredible. This is the deep blue captured by you. You're about to see the sea's biggest, baddest and most bizarre through the lens of the internet's best viral video. Welcome to Deep Blue Discovery. Coming up, a diver explores the wreck of a real warship, but first, the story of an intelligent beluga with a cheeky side. Hammerfest, Norway. To start with, let's introduce the story's protagonists. The beluga here is called Havaldemir. He's famous in the bay, but can disappear for long periods of time. It's not always possible to share the water with him. The man filming is a travelling extraordinaire called Joachim Larsen. Before this happened, he had been kayaking around Norway for 117 days, sleeping in a tent. He set out that day, hoping to see Havaldemir. I knew that Havaldemir used to be in the area, but uh, I have heard that he had been disappeared for a month's time. So a couple of days earlier, I said to my friend, oh, I hope Valdemir is there. It turned out to be Joachim's lucky day. He can set the scene. I uh, get in my kayak in the morning. I start up. I'm really cold. I get uh, into Hammerfest, where I have ordered the leftover meals from my hotel. And uh, as I kayak in, Suddenly, he's underneath me, and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> there he is. Cool. He decided to film the happy beluga, and what happened next was astonishing. He is more interested in playing around with me than uh, go and eat. Wow, that's good. <laughs> put my camera in the water and then suddenly he, he just bites down on it and just starts pulling on it. And if I don't let go, he's gonna bring me with him, so I just let go. Camera drops and I'm like, come on, Baldemir, that's not nice. Then he looks at me. He goes down, he gets the camera. And then he comes up again, give it to me. And I'm like, wow, it's recording. Watching the camera, then returning it to its owner, playfully, isn't something the average person would expect an animal to do, especially not a whale. But Havaldemir isn't an ordinary animal. Not only is he particularly tame, but belugas are also known for their intelligence and cheekiness. They have the ability to learn and have good memories. They've even been recorded mimicking divers. Still, that doesn't mean Joachim expected to have his camera returned to him in such a playful way. It really was uh, amazing. I was, uh, I was really surprised that he did it. He just wanted to play. He knew what the camera was. You can see it when he looked at it, like, okay, I know what this is. And uh, when uh, he was found the first uh, days in Norway, he had a GoPro harness on him that said St. Petersburg. So he has used these kind of cameras before and he has probably gotten some kind of reward for bringing it back earlier. After getting his camera back, Joachim knew how incredible the footage was going to be. But when people saw it, not everyone was so positive. Some thought he should have fed Havaldemir, while others suggested 
he shouldn't have touched him. Most people thought he wanted food, and a lot of people have been like, you're for not bringing him food. So I spent a lot of time like responding to that because he is a wild animal, uh, or we are trying to have him to be as wild as possible. And as long as a wild animal can catch his own fish, we should never give him fish because that might change his behavior and he may, uh, might get aggressive if you don't give him food. This is why I don't bring fish. Uh, also, that the fish will smell. And uh, the longer the fish stays above surface, uh, it takes in other bacteria that might make the whale sick. So it's a lot of reason why why you shouldn't feed them. But uh, and normally I don't even touch the animals. But uh, he, he actually started touching me first. So, and uh, the girl that was responsible for him, she said, "Okay, you need to touch him now, or he's going to be uh, annoyed." This moment was clearly memorable, and the video had an impact on everyone who saw it. You just don't see happy interactions like this all that often, but for Joaquim, that causes mixed emotions. A lot of people are saying that, uh, oh, uh, you had a once-in-a-lifetime moment, and I had a lot of once-in-a-lifetime moments, and I feel a little sad when people say it was in a lifetime moment because that means they are not expecting it to happen again. If you get out in nature and you are calm in nature, not make too many noises and let the animals come to you, then you will experience things like this. There, cat's gonna jump right here. Still to come on Deep Blue Discovery, why do whales breach? A look at what we actually know. the South Shetland Islands. Some humpback whales eat in an interesting way. This pattern was captured by a drone camera and it shows a group fishing method known as bubble net feeding. The technique isn't actually natural to humpbacks. It's passed on generation to generation and not every pod knows how to do it. Bubble net feeding involves the whole pod producing bubbles and circling a school of fish, corralling them into a small space. They communicate very carefully to achieve this. When the fish are successfully trapped, one of the whales will issue a feeding call, at which point the whales swim upwards for a feast. On the surface, it might look something like this. This video was filmed off California. You can see just how many fish the humpback manages to get into its mouth in one go. It's called lunge feeding. That means charging towards a school of fish and engulfing as many as possible in one huge mouthful. When we say huge mouthful, we really mean it. He's coming up right here, dude. Check out this breach in Alaska's Nudson Cove Marina and you'll see what we mean. Shirkavoy, Norway. Whales can pop up pretty much anywhere. If there's food below, you could find yourself right next to a pod of humpbacks, like this guy. This was clearly an incredible experience for kayaker Morten Bjorkman. San Ignacio Lagoon. Mexico. Whales are very social creatures and will often approach tourist boats. This grey whale may well be asking for food, but it also appears to want to be touched. It's as if it enjoys being petted. Who knows what the truth is, but a large number of whale species do seem more than happy to interact with humans, 
and they'll poke their heads out of the water to make contact. Here's another example of a social grey whale off California. Sydney, Australia. The filmer of this footage suggested these humpback whales were playing. That may well be the case, but it could be something else too. Spy hopping is when whales lift their heads vertically out of the water. It's not known exactly why they do this, but it appears to be so they can get a good look at their surroundings. Who knows though, they may be playing too. Uanukohihifo, Tonga. Whales also need to surface to breathe. This once-in-a-lifetime footage was captured by two stunned sailors. It's an hours-old whale taking its first breaths after being helped to the surface by its mother. New South Wales, Australia. Whales push air, water and mucus out of their blowholes, and each species has a distinctive style of blow. This is a blue whale, the biggest of them all, nearly knocking a drone out of the sky as it fires mucus into the air. Chrissy Field Beach, California. In certain parts of the world where these big creatures are common, it's important to keep an eye out for where they might surface. This guy was kiteboarding off California when a whale suddenly blocked his path. Fortunately, both whale and kiteboarder were fine. Real breaching is what the whale watching tourists want to see. Breaching is when most or all of the whale's body leaves the water, and it can be spectacular. A lot of whale species do it, but humpbacks seem to love it more than most. It's actually not 100% known why these guys love leaping. The theories are as follows. It might be to communicate, attract other whales, warn off predators, or even to warn off keen males. One day, we'll know for certain. Oh, they're calf's gonna jump right here. Still to come on Deep Blue Discovery, what diving inside a sunken warship is really like. You're inside the USS Spiegel Grove, a Navy ship deliberately sunk two decades ago. It's become one of the most interesting dive sites in the United States not just because it's a massive artificial reef system, but because it has a curious backstory. We spoke to the dive master who filmed this footage, and he told us everything there is to know about this awesome wreck. I've had quite a few really amazing encounters with marine life. This particular dive is 
is in the Key Largo area of Florida. Wreck diving can be dangerous, but it's also interesting. And as Michael Airy explains, the USS Spiegel Grove is unique. I love swimming through shipwrecks. The, the challenge of uh, safely navigating an enclosed environment is, is a thrill that I enjoy very much. And a great thing about exploring the Spiegel Grove is that it's, it's a relatively safe shipwreck to penetrate. It was purposefully sunk, and the people who sank the ship, they cleared out the inside and removed a lot of the debris that would ordinarily be a severe hazard for most divers. At more than 500 feet, it's much larger than any natural reef in the Florida Keys, and its size was part of the appeal. Part of what I like about it is that it's so big, which means there's lots of places to explore, a lot of corridors, a lot of nooks and crannies, rooms to check out, multiple levels to go up and down. So it, it really offers a lot of entertainment for someone who wants to check that out. It also has a bit of an interesting backstory. The Spiegel Grove was decommissioned as a Navy vessel in the late 1980s after serving for more than 30 years. It then spent more than a decade mothballed in Virginia's James River, before being towed in 2001 to its new home in the Florida Keys. The ship was supposed to be deliberately sunk to create an artificial reef, but in May 2002, it unexpectedly sank early, just hours before it was due to be scuttled. Some extra work was done, but the vessel was essentially left on its starboard side. That's not how it's sitting today in this footage, though. Three years later in 2005, Hurricane Dennis hit the Keys and somehow turned the Spiegel Grove upright. Thanks to Michael, we can really get a sense of what it's like to swim inside the wreck today. Well, exploring the wreck is a lot of fun. It, it does have uh, something of a spooky element to it because first of all, it's dark inside. So you do need to bring your own lights. Where I was shooting video of the interior, I had plenty of light. I had all my video lights going, so that wasn't a, really an issue. But Still, with all the lights on, you're casting shadows everywhere. So you're always catching little movements out of the corner of your eye, and as well as all the fish that are down there. There's a lot of fish that swim around. So there is a something of a spooky element to exploring inside a shipwreck. Michael mentioned fish there, and the Spiegel Grove is now indeed an artificial reef ecosystem. It's teeming with wildlife. It was fun to see all the different marine life that had taken up residence, though, inside the ship. That was pretty neat. There was a lot of uh, a lot of fish swimming around inside. Nothing really big. There were no sharks or anything exciting like that. But th but there was a, a very. It's become a very healthy artificial reef, which is nice. No sharks then. But what sort of wildlife did he find down there? Snappers, stripers, those kind of things, and the dive was quite a while ago, so I'm kind of straining my memory to recall exactly what marine life I saw, but they were your typical schooling fish. Diving inside a real shipwreck sounds like something you'd only see in the movies, which is one of the main reasons Michael loves it so much. I really get a kick out of making my way through narrow doorways, going up and down the, the staircases and through the hatches. That's something that I find uh, really fun because you, you have to be very conscious that you don't touch anything, that you don't come in contact with any surfaces. You have to be very careful about um, avoiding any kind of entanglements. So while I'm wending my way through different uh, doorways and hatches and going from level to level, that's something that I, I particularly enjoy because of the challenge but also at one point you'll see in the video, I find a hatch that goes down to a lower level. And what I do is I, I pull all my limbs in so that I, I'm kind of um, in a little ball. And then you exhale in order to facilitate descending. And I slowly creep down through the opening to the next level below. 
and then I can spread out again and start looking around. So that 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 kind of thing is something I I really enjoy is is navigating through the tight spaces. It does require some fairly advanced training. It's not for the novice diver. And when the dive was over, there were a handful of divers who were in no shape to do a second dive. So it, it's not for the faint of heart and it's not something to be undertaken lightly. You really do need to look into additional training before you seriously consider penetrating a shipwreck. It really requires some serious training. The ocean is home to hundreds of thousands of species. Deep Blue Discovery is dedicated to highlighting as many of them as possible. All of the footage you've just seen was shot by members of the public and not specifically for this program. It just goes to show that you never know what you might encounter if you enter the Deep Blue. Coming up next time on Deep Blue Discovery, we're all things sharks as we speak to a man chased by hundreds of hungry predators. That's next time on Deep Blue Discovery. Whenever we winch the nets up, like the sharks get attracted to the noise of the, the engines. The sharks get to know that there's food coming. And it's not just in this area here, it's all the way along the coast. And the numbers and all the fishermen are complaining about how many sharks there are.